of peace. We like them knowing full well that peace is elusive, and in some parts of the world, it is almost completely absent. Yet in this season of Advent, we trust that God is never absent from us. God is always preparing something new, and even where there is war and discord, whether between countries, within families, or within our own hearts, God is present, gently leading us to new possibilities. At this time, I invite those who have been given candles to please bring them forward, light them using the center candle in the sand, and then place them in the sand. And while doing this, I invite the congregation to join in singing the first and seventh stanzas of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
They desperately longed for a leader that would bring them security and peace and redeem David's kingdom. Isaiah, the prophet, speaks this word of hope to them in the midst of their fear and despair, reassuring them that no matter how bad their past leaders have been, nor how inept their current leaders may be, they can look toward a future with a different kind of leader who will usher in a new peace-filled reality. Because the spirit of God will rest upon this new king the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. This is the leader, the king, who will usher in the reign of God here on earth, an era of global well-being, peace and justice for all of creation. Now, while it's likely that as Isaiah had Hezekiah, son of Azaz, in mind when he shared this vision, Christians have looked to passages like this from the Hebrew Bible to frame the ministry of Jesus. The genealogies and the Gospels of Matthew and Luke reveal Jesus to be the son of the King of David, King David, and therefore Jesse is often looked upon as the first person in the genealogy of Jesus. A Jesse tree, then, is a way of preparing for Advent the coming of Christ, by journeying through the stories on Jesus' family tree. It's a countdown daily to Christmas with a telling of a story and an ornament that acts as a symbol and a visual reminder of the story. And it's literally one of the best ways to make sure that one keeps Christ in Christmas. But regardless of your level of familiarity with the Jesse tree, I'm guessing that this passage was familiar to you because it beautifully and succinctly gives voice to our hopes and dreams for every Christmas Eve. That our leaders in all domains will use their position and power to lead with wisdom, with justice toward all, and with mercy toward the most vulnerable in our society. We read this text during Advent with a sense of expectation and hope, looking forward to the fulfillment of the promises of God, a time of all things being made right. But the promises that Isaiah speaks seem almost as impossible as they are compelling, probably to the people then and likely to us today as well. Enemies becoming companions. All children safe from harm, wise national leadership, a world without war or mass shootings or active shooter drills or a national terrorism advisory system. That is the vision of the peaceable kingdom. And as Maureen mentioned and several of the kids realized they had seen it, it is the vision captured beautifully by Edward Hicks' paintings of the same name. What's interesting to me, though, is that Hicks actually painted more than 60 different versions of the Peaceable Kingdom. And all portray the biblical scene with the animals in the forefront, in bright colors with vivid features. But most, if not all of them, also include a contemporary scene to the left of the animals, sort of in the background, just beyond or near a body of water. And I invite you to Google it and look for the different versions. You can actually find them, which show different people in that, in that gathering on the side. Interpreters say that it's most often a depiction of William Penn and his associates making peace with a group of Native Americans as a depiction of the artist's 19th century concept of peacemaking. But as you heard from the children, we may disagree with Hicks' example and understanding of true peacemaking from our 21st century perspective. It's still very much relevant for us, though, to note that the artist wanted to call our attention to the tension between the vision of the glorious kingdom and the contemporary reality. He offers a visual depiction of the, prof the prophets already and not yet. 
while waiting for that promised glorious kingdom to come and basking in the glow of that hope, we are still called to be about the business of making peace. You've heard it said, if you want peace, work for justice, and also there can be no justice without peace, and there can be no peace without justice. In the UCC and here at Pilgrim, we spend a lot of time and righteous energy addressing issues of injustice, and it's work that is important in the world and to our understanding of our call as followers of Christ. It's also essential to making the vision of the peaceable kingdom a reality. But today I would like us to briefly consider what it might look like, feel like, or even be like if we were also to engage more directly in the business of making peace, of being peacemakers. Might that shorten the journey between the fear-filled, anxious, and acrimonious present and the shalom that awaits us in the peaceable kingdom. Now, as I reflected on the potential impact and implications of being a more active peacemaker, it quickly became clear that keeping peace and making peace might be related, but they definitely are not synonyms. It also became quickly clear to me that keeping peace is a lot easier. A peacekeeper is one who tries to keep things peaceful, often by mediating conflicts or calming people down. Their presence tends to make everyone feel more comfortable, and they're particularly handy to invite to a big family gathering where the priority is making sure that everyone has a good time. A peacemaker also strives to create peace, but through reconciliation. Peacemakers can't ignore issues or try to smooth things over without actually resolving the issue. They are willing to put themselves in the middle of a conflict and point towards important, unchanging truths. God cares about justice. God cares about all of creation. Not just humans, not just us, not just the people that we care about. I think it's fair to say that peacemakers are less often invited to parties than peacekeepers. A peacemaker seeks to disturb the status quo in an effort to hasten the arrival of the peaceable kingdom. Because the promise that Isaiah speaks to in today's text is extraordinarily and seemingly unnatural. The oldest of enemies, wolf and lamb, leopard kid, calf, cow, cow, bear, lion, ox, all are made friends. The rules of life will be changed and the world will be ordered so that the fragile and vulnerable can have their say and live their lives. There will be peace, but not just any peace, shalom. Shalom, as defined by Walter Brueggemann, is creation time, when all God's creation eases up on hostility and destruction and finds another way of relating. Peacemakers help us realize that the strife and discord and suffering that surround us are really abnormalities of life that we've come to expect and even tolerate as just how things are and that what is truly, actually normal is peace and unity and healing. It doesn't have to be this way. So while waiting for that promised glorious kingdom to come, we are called to point to, work for, shout out, and claim the reign of God now, letting the eternal hope of the peaceable kingdom inspire, inform, and guide how we live our lives in the present. Nelson Mandela was one of the great peacemakers of our lifetime. He lived by the words, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy. Then he becomes your partner. But peacemaking is neither quick nor easy. If it was easy, it probably wouldn't make change in the world. 
There's lots of challenges with the role of peacemaker, but perhaps the part that feels the most difficult to me at this moment, at this time in our country, is the implication of how we are called to relate to our enemies. First of all, it feels like we've gotten a bit fast and loose with the term enemy, both how we define it and how quick we are to label people. There's little question today that America is divided politically, economically, ethnically, and truthfully, we've always been divided despite the popularized image of a homogeneous melting pot. What has changed, however, appears to be our willingness to engage in constructive dialogue with those who don't see things exactly as we do, who bring a different perspective born of their lived experience. Even if we don't literally call everyone who disagrees with us on important issues of justice, fairness, mercy, politics, policy, pick your issue, even if we don't actually call them our enemy, many of our current leaders model for us that we are to treat people with opposing views in a manner that one would normally treat a hostile adversary. Try to gain an advantage, an upper hand, by putting them at a disadvantage. Weaken their support, perhaps by sharing unflattering information or pictures or planting seeds of concern about them. Silence them, or at least block them on Facebook. Do whatever it takes to win, to defeat them and their point of view, because if we win, the end will justify the means. Now, I know that might sound extreme and somewhat ridiculous, or maybe not, given what we observe happening on the news, but certainly that's not how we view our own behavior. Still, I challenge you, as, as Maureen challenged the children to go out and do a peacemaking action, I challenge you to pause for a moment during this season of Advent and create your own contemporary mental picture of the peaceable kingdom. You can, you can keep all the animals, all the animal predators posing up with their former prey in the foreground, but I want you to imagine you in this left-hand scene, beyond the water, making peace with someone that you currently can't imagine sharing common ground with. Maybe it's a Democrat or a Republican. Maybe it's a member of President Trump's base or a never-Trumper. Maybe it's a gun rights activist, a white supremacist, or a climate change denier. Maybe it's a diverse group of people, each representing some policy or point of view that you just can't imagine reconciling your own with. But that's exactly what Isaiah's vision asks us to do to imagine a world in which natural enemies are living peacefully in a place where there is no more hurt. What would this holy mountain look like for us? What would it take for us to join with those whom we, with whom we strongly disagree? To engage in transformative collaboration for the benefit of the greater good. During this Advent season, as we joyfully anticipate the birth of Jesus, the baby Jesus, and the coming of the risen and adult Christ, we reflect that he never told us to love a cause or to love a religion. He told us to love God and to love people. As we undertake that healthy but not easy task, may we be the peacemakers that this world so desperately needs, empowered and strengthened by the support of being in community, and with the confidence and the courage that comes from knowing that God is with us every step of this journey. Amen.